Hi everyone, so we're continuing with uh, sports psychology and uh, we're looking at leadership part one. So we've split leadership into two sections. Um, we're going to look at in this lesson, uh, we will look at uh, emergent versus prescribed characteristics of a leader and um, the, the leadership styles. Um, and then um, in, in the next lesson, we'll look at the theories of leadership and the multi-dimensional model. So before we get any further into leadership, a bit of a retrieval question for you. Some AS content um, for skill acquisition to change it up a little bit. Um, so what I want you to do is to, on the Google Doc or on in your notes and uh, send me the photo, uh, describe using practical examples for each what's meant by positive, negative, proactive, retroactive transfer. Um, so four marks, you get a mark for um, defining the type of transfer and then giving the sport an example. So for instance, positive, well, uh, it's where a skill helps the learning of a new skill. An example would be um, an overarm throw in cricket, helping um, the the learning of the javelin throw. So there's an example for you. And um, pause this video, get that question completed. Now, okay, well done. So, um, sports psychology, uh, sport psychology, and we're looking at leadership. Um, let's start off with looking at emergent versus prescribed leaders. So we've got two different types of leaders according to this. We've got leaders who are emergent. So, you know, think as this as the leader is emerging out of a group. Um, so that might be, you know, in the changing room, one of the players is the emergent leader in that group. OK, they're not might be that they're not appointed the leader, but it might be the person that everyone goes to for, um, you know, for, for advice and guidance. Um, you know, or we could look at the fact that, you know, out of a group of a group of players, this player has been voted in to be the captain of those players. Okay, so emerging is they're emerging from the group. Okay, so they are they are coming from the group to become the leader. Whereas a prescribed leader would be someone who is appointed from the outside. So from another team. Um, so that you know, so Sam Allardyce going to West Brom recently, he would be the prescribed leader. You know, the West Bromwich Albion Football Club board have appointed um, Saladice to be the new manager and he's come from another team. So there's your two differences with emergence and prescribed. Um, so if we go back to emergent, so the benefits of, of emergent, well, because they're coming from within that group, they're more likely to be accepted. Um, it's because they already have an understanding of you know, the strengths and weaknesses of, of, of individuals. They've already got an understanding of the, the group dynamics, so the, the clicks within the groups. Um, so they've already got this, this um, understanding of, of the, the storming, norming and um, performing um, model. Um, so they've already understand it. They already understand the team um, dynamics. So they're understanding how to work with the different people already. So it means that they, they can just get started and they can just work straight away. Um, prescribed leaders, on the other hand, well, their benefits is the fact that they can come in and be a bit more objective. They can, you know, come in with new ideas and maybe this could motivate different different players, so maybe players that haven't been playing well um, prior. So um, prescribed leaders tend to be more authoritarian um, than comparing to emergent leaders. So um, because someone coming from the outside in, you don't know what they're like. So you're, you're more likely going to have a different relationship with them compared to an emergent leader. So what do you have to do? What do you have to know? Um, well, this is really what you have to be able to do. You have to be able to define what it is. So define emergent, define and prescribe with example. That's the best way of defining it. You have to be able to give advantages, but you also need to know the howevers. So, for example, you know, um, let's go for emergent. So define it with an example. So that might be um, an assistant coach becoming a head coach or a group voting or you know a cricket group voting in their captain. There's your example. Comes from within the group. Advantage, well, straight away, it's accepted by the group and they understand the the um, the dynamics of the group. They're the advantages of the emergent leader. However, 
The disadvantages of this is that, well, it could become over familiar. So because they've already got these relationships, they they may, and this is what we we're looking at, just what we we're just looking at about the prescribed leader being more authoritarian. They may, the group may not see that individual as the authoritarian leader. So they may get away with more. So we've got this element of over familiarity. Prescribed leaders then, well, define. So this is your new coach from another team. So from outside the group coming in, advantages of this, new ideas, and it motivates the players. Because you, you're establishing here, hopefully, some creativity within the group. And that's why we normally see in football teams, when they get the new manager coming in, um, they have this sudden like um, honeymoon period where they start performing really well because the prescribed leaders come in and he, they're motivating the players differently with these new ideas. However, the disadvantage of this is that they don't understand the group. You know, they don't understand the group dynamics. So when they come in, they might ruffle some feathers and they might um, end up actually demoting the bait in the players because they start, maybe the, the coach comes in and wants to step their foot down. So they start, they aim at the, the you know, one of the players and then the rest of the players don't like that. So it could be um, that they don't understand the group dynamics and that could put them on the back foot. So that's emergent versus prescribed leaders. You need to know the two. You need to be able to know advantage and disadvantage for each one. Um, we'll have a little look now at characteristics of a leader. So what makes an effective leadership? I'll let you have a quick read through those um, characteristics of, of, of a, an effective leader in sport. But I, I want to pick out four key characteristics. So um, have, a, have a pause, have a read through. And then I'll talk about the four uh, characteristics um, that I want you to really to focus on. So key characteristics of an effective leader. The way of just remember this is the three C's plus the F. So C, 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 F. So the key characteristics, firstly, we need to have a good communicator and the communication needs to be both verbal and non-verbal. So um, by verbal, I mean by using specific language. That's not jargon. That's um, clear and suitable for the performer. Non-verbal being the, you know, the um, body language needs to be positive to ensure that, the, you know, that because, you know, a lot of people can read body language really well. So if, I, if I'm talking to you and I'm looking annoyed at you, that's not going to make you feel that you're doing something well. So body language is, is a real important um, communicator to, um, to participants and to athletes and performers. Two, um, charisma. Well, in charisma, it's all about this being motivated, being enthusiastic, um, you know, being creative, persistent, ambitious. All of these things come in with, with the charisma. So um, if you think about, you know, charisma um, leaders like Jose Mourinho is able to use his his charm, his charisma to um, to get people to buy in to what he wants them to do. So that that charisma is really important. Um, three, confidence. Well, confidence in actually they know, you know, they've got good knowledge in the sport and the tactics, but in confidence within themselves. So being able to have a good uh, decision maker, be able to be well organized, to be able to um, have the experience. All of these things come under that confidence banner. OK, so lots of confidence instills confidence in the performers and then they can go and perform. And the last one is flexibility. Now, flexibility is a really key one because it fits into what we'll look at next. So a flexible leader has to be able to change their leadership style. And what I mean by leadership style is this. So leadership styles, we've got three different styles. We've got autocratic, democratic and laissez-faire. Um, now, an, a, an effective leader is able to use these different styles with different groups. So if we were to look at the, the, let's start with autocratic, okay? So an autocratic leader makes all the decisions, okay? They are the dictator and their only concern is the outcome. So they're task orientated. They, they do not want to make a relationship with the players. They just want them to achieve and, and, and um, get to that end point. So that might be someone like Sir Alex Ferguson. OK, the old Manchester United football manager, task orientated, wasn't wasn't a person um, concerned with outcomes. No, sorry, it wasn't a person con concerned with um, relationships. You know, you could see that you know, if the players weren't performing at half time, he'd go into, into the change rooms and he'd 
He famously kicked a football boot at David Beckham's head because he wasn't happy with how he was performing. And that's someone that's not bothered about the person. They they were bothered about the task. Um, so this is really effective. And this is something you need to be able to do. And they say, when would the leader need to change the leadership style? When is it going to be used for? So for autocratic, it's best used with beginners. So think about a beginner, someone that probably doesn't know how to perform in, the, in that sport. Well, they need all the guidance possible. So they want the leader to tell them what they need to do. It's also suitable for large groups. If you've got large amounts of people, you don't want it being an absolute nightmare of everyone all over the place. You want to be telling them exactly what to do at what point. If a skill is dangerous, so if I'm taking you um, rock climbing, um, you have to listen to the, what the leader is saying, because if you don't and you do something where you don't, you you know, you then could fall off the wall and hurt yourself. So it's important to listen to the leader to, to make sure that you are remaining safe. And finally, there's research that that suggests that actually males respond better to an autocratic leader. Then we've got democratic leadership. Now, well, this is someone who's democratic is someone who shares the decision making. So it might be that they involve the group members in what they want the overall outcome to be. What do they want? The You know, what should we do now? Um, it might be a leader that that delegates and gives the responsibility to the, the, the um, athletes. So that might be, um, you know, you've got a group of um, Sunday league footballers. They, you know, they, they know how to play the sport. They're a relatively good ability. And you might say, well, what do you want to train today? So it, you, you're passing the responsibility onto the, onto the group members. Now, this is all about person orientated. So this is about relationship orientated leadership. So, you know, Kia, I'll go, sorry, I'm going to football again. So not um, Jurgen Klopp, OK, Liverpool's football um, manager. You can see it every time they're finishing the game, he's going up, he's hugging the players. Regardless of whether they win or lose, he goes, he hugs, he high fives, he, he motivates them. He is more orientated about the, the, the relationship because he knows if he can make the relationship work, then the the performers are going to more likely perform at a high standard for him. So who would this get used for? Well, it's really useful for small groups, for, for groups where it's a safe and it's not, not dangerous. It's really useful for high ability because they understand what they need to do. So they will have an actual good input into that, that decision making. Tends to be females prefer this type of leadership. But the last um, uh, leadership style is laissez affair. And um, this one is where the, the leader actually doesn't do a lot. OK, he's going to sit back and um, they're going to allow the group to make the decision. So. This will be used predominantly for allowing these or usually it's going to be predominantly for elite performers because they know where they have to improve because they've got good motor programs. They've got um, lots of ability to be able to reflect on, on what's working and what's not working. Um, but this opportunity to just say, right, go and do it develops the creativity. It also it, it encourages the, the motivation and trust in, in, in the leader. So. Going back to this leadership, effective leadership styles, that number four flexibility is so important because a coach then has to go through each one of these to reflect what the group wants. Does the group, so am I taking you rock climbing? Does the group want me to be autocratic? Um, are you playing football? A lot of you know how to play football. So could I then be democratic and get your input into what you want to, to work on? Or am I going to be lazy affair and I'm going to say, right, okay, we're going to go and do um, badminton. Go and do whatever you want. You make the decisions. OK, so it's you then are going in there. You're developing your, your motivation. Also, there's a, a, an element of trust there being developed as well. So uh, it, it all depends on what the group wants, but also depends on all those other aspects that we've spoken about for being used for. OK, so um, any point you can go back, pause the video, go over those contents again. Um, last uh, part I want you to do today is go back onto that Google document and complete that second question. So describe as your fair approach to leadership and give one reason why it could be said that this approach is unsuitable for leading a novice in sport. So two marks, two points need to be made. 
Um, well done, and I'll speak to 